Now, I also noticed you guys took a, a, a pretty skeptical stance on nuclear energy, which is well, also another a Nuclear favorite. energy seemed like a great idea. Now, you're of a certain age, but the idea was you dig this stuff up, this rock, you distill it, purify it, in, by the way, in fantastically complicated, chemically dangerous ways, you, just, you purify it, but it can be done. And then you fish in it, cool, you boil water, and you make steam and make electricity, all good, and then you put it back in the ground. Fabulous, what's not to love about that? Trouble is after you've purified it, it's crazy dangerous. You know, when you get this, the radioactive fuel itself is dangerous, but all the stuff, the rubber gloves, the paper coveralls, the masks, the the mops for the floor, everything becomes radioactive and getting rid of all of that stuff adds a huge amount of cost. And there was a big concern, still is, that the nuclear industry, nuclear industry is just not being straight with everybody. You know, that, oh, it's perfectly safe, oh, it's great. But I'll tell you, we went to a nuclear facility. You don't have to know that much about it. They put it in a cask that'll last 40 years. Oh, then what do you do with it? Well, they're going to work that out. Uh, they're going to, that's going to be figured out in 40 years. Is it? Really, it hasn't been figured out in the last 60, so why would you figure out the next 40? And then apparently in Japan, the same sort of traditions. This Fukushima blew up, huge, I mean, albeit under extraordinary circumstances, giant earthquake, tsunami. The earth actually sank a little, which made the tsunami come farther inshore. Okay, all this stuff happened, uh, but you have a huge mess. So my argument now, everybody, we have 800,000 oil wells around the world. Now, an oil well is not a nuclear reactor, okay, I give you, I'll, I'm right there. It's much more benign. A gusher is no big deal. 350, uh, rather 3,500 offshore rigs, about. We had one of them blow up in the summer of 2010, or the spring and summer of 2010. People went crazy, the deep horizons. People went nuts. Uh, this is horrible. You've got to do something about this. Oil's flowing all over the wetlands. This is horrible. There are 434, now you might cynically say 433, nuclear reactors, commercial, commercial reactors around the world. But what happens when there's uh, 4,333? 14,000 nuclear reactors. There will be another accident. It will be a, near an urban center that will have to be abandoned from radioactivity. So everybody, we gotta ask these questions. Yeah. There will be another blow up, because there are humans running the thing. They're not geniuses, sorry everybody. I mean, they're not perfect. Mistakes will be made, and then what do you do? Let alone the waste. Yeah. Toxic for, depends how you estimate, estimate 10,000 years. How long did the Roman Empire go? A thousand years? 10 Roman empires, you're supposed to put it someplace? I mean, maybe. I'm skeptical, <laughs> skeptical. Uh, speaking of skepticism, uh, what uh, a lot of people use the word woo, some bullshit. What, what is your word for pseudo reality? Well, pseudo pseudoscience is what I say. Because the thing that I focus on when I can is the claim. You got to have a claim to evaluate. I yeah. claim I can read your mind. I claim I can look at your birthday and predict your future. Uh, then you evaluate that claim in a scientific fashion. And so that is to say, make an observation, you think about what caused it, you hypothesize, then you come up with a test for that hypothesis and you see what happens. So I like the term pseudoscience. Now uh, of all the pseudoscience out there, what is your biggest pet peeve? Like what's the Achilles heel of Bill Nye? Uh, well my concern right now is what I would, what people call, well I guess generally just scientific illiteracy. It's just to say you don't have enough rudimentary knowledge of the universe to evaluate claims. And I, I, as you may know, I don't blame the individual for this. I blame me. I mean, I blame our educational system for not helping people. Like, for example, I uh, used to think the lottery was okay. If you want to play the lottery, you know, okay. Yeah. I used to feel that was all right. But I've come to realize it's really a tax on people who don't know math. And, uh, and the reason they don't know math is we didn't show them. And so uh, I won't say I take full responsibility for that, but I used to think it was not, it was a benign thing. Now I think it's probably not that good. Yeah. Because it, it, it ends up being, it really does end up being a tax on poor people. The people who can least afford it 
end up spending the most money on. And that's not, it's not in anyone's best interest. Now, of all the pseudoscience out there, what would be, if it could be real, what would you want to be real? Like, what's the coolest pseudoscience out there? Wow. Like the most fun. Oh, th well, the coolest would be if there were a limitless source of energy from someplace. Lightning storms or, uh, or put a magnet on your carburetor, if you remember <laughs> carburetors. Put a magnet on your fuel injection system and you'll somehow get much better mileage. But that turns out to be... Yeah. And the guys, well, the baseball players are wearing things around their neck to make them hit better. Very skeptical. <laughs> wow. Very skeptical. Right and I, wanted, I want you guys to know, I knew a very cute woman who will, refuses to have a crush on a baseball player who wears any kind of necklace. <laughs> so just, you, she's, you, have, you do not have access to her if you wear the necklace. Okay? Think about that. That's evolution, friends. That's right. Your genes would have no chance of mixing with hers as long as you got that on. Okay, uh, now, uh, <laughs> one, of my, one of my last questions, uh, and this, this raised uh, a few eyebrows in the skeptical community, is the, uh, the Activon product. Oh, uh, Active Ion. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so Active I'm very skeptical. Active Ion. So let's talk about bubbles. So why do bubbles form on the inside of a vessel? You leave it sit, let it sit there for a few days. There's argument. No one's got, no one can show you here's why. Clearly nucleation sites, like if you've got a beer glass and you have dust in it or the equivalent of all, not completely washed out beer, yeah. it forms bubbles more easily. My grandmother's champagne glasses are hollow stemmed from France. She was French from France. Uh, hollow stemmed because it makes the bubbles form. You can't get the stem ever quite clean so it, the bubbles form there, clearly true. All right. But what happens when you have a bubble that's 50 molecules across? And this is a nano bubble, and yeah. some people call them nano voids. But from a marketing standpoint, a void just isn't as happy as a bubble. Okay. So these uh, voids are able to persist for a surprisingly long time. They apparently, Apparently, and I'm, look, prove me wrong, you guys, bring it on. But these uh, voids or bubbles are able to hold a charge for on the order of a minute, a surprisingly long time. And then those charges are able to kill germs. This is a surprising thing. They get to the cell wall or the membrane of a, germ, of a bacterium and they cause it to uh, denature. They cause it to fall apart. And so... Uh, this, this effect of killing germs, the more zap you give this water with the bubbles in it, is provable and showable and great. It's just very much out of your everyday experience. Yeah. And then along with that, the charged up water generally attracts a certain kind of dirt, especially clays like alkalines. It'll, <gasps> it'll suck them up. It, does, it cleans pretty well, the active ion water, but what it really does is kill germs. It's quite surprising. So what I charm me about the product is it looks like a way to do more with less. Now, it's not free. You're, you're putting energy, you have to, it takes a battery in this bubble maker, this nano cell, they call it for uh, short. And it makes bubbles that last 30 seconds. It clearly kills germs, kills germs. Uh, and it cleans pretty well. So this is a cool product to me. It's not, as I say, it's not a panacea that's gonna change the world, but. <laughs> It really is surprising. And I went to London and I met with the world's foremost authority on nanobubbles. And it's, it's a real thing. The bubbles are there, the voids are there. Huh? And it's electrostatic or it's uh, a balance between an electric charge in these voids and the pressure of the fluid gonna compress it. And it's about 150 molecules can hold, can be around this void for a little while. And then it gives up. So the charge you know, finds its way into the fluid. Then another thing that really charms me about bubbles, those nanobubbles are billionths of a meter. We're talking now about bubbles that are millionths of a meter, thousandths of a millimeter. And these things persist in water for a long time, hours, water, uh, hours, days. Because to the bubble, the water is like shampoo or maple syrup. 
but uh, to you and me, the water's thin. You know, I mean, to a bubble, if you're that small, the water's quite viscous. So these bubbles reflect light. So I'm imagining a day where the World Bubble Council controls the bubbleators on the back of all the big ships, all these cargo ships which are plying the seas all the time. All the military ships would be required to have certain bubbleization devices. And then we would control the Earth's albedo, the Earth's reflectance, its whiteness, by the World Bubble Council. Now I admit, this is an idea so crazy, and so on. <laughs> but I'd really like to investigate it. And to investigate it takes some, some complicated research. The ocean's a big place, salt water's complicated, yeah. seawater rather is complicated. And so uh, it's an idea so crazy it just might work. It may be bunk, but uh, as far as the active ion goes, you guys, just let me say try it before you bite my head off. <laughs> and uh, really try it with germs. There, there are food industry standards and machines and devices for testing the number of germs left after you've sterilized a surface or rather um, disinfected a surface that's a term of art in the food industry just try it and then then bite my head off all right okay. now uh tam nine what can we expect from you i oh man the greatest show on <laughs> earth no i'll do a, a presentation with electronic slides i'll have a long thing about long thing a couple of three slides about my old professor Carl Sagan my relationship to him how he got me started down the skeptical road and the big th the big thing I tell everybody it's very easy to be cynical um, hey you don't know what you're talking about you astrology is bunk you you're you're an idiot I paraphrase that's not going to bring people uh, to our point of view yeah we have to embrace people and and the other thing I remind everybody it takes time. You, when you're first exposed to a pseudoscience proof, you're first shown that astrology's bunk after your mother did it, your grandmother did it, and you, you're raised with tarot cards, I'm using for example. It takes you a long time to sort of come to terms with that. Uh, in the same way, the, the deep thinkers, and I'm not saying I'm Einstein, but Albert Einstein, Darwin, these guys, made these discoveries and they sat and thought about it like is that really it i'm going to try this i'm, I'm going to try that i'm going to try i, I got to investigate this and so you have to everybody we have to be patient we have to keep the message going in a positive way and it's really easy to sink in that into that you're an idiot you suck <laughs> point of view so i'm really looking forward to tam yeah big fun big fun thanks for inviting me yeah well uh huge thanks for coming don't take my word for it be skeptical no, really. Be, no, don't. No, you. Decide for yourself.